So I will just be very short and introduce Wookie, who will now give you an, an embedded Debian presentation. Wookie. Okay, hello everyone. So, uh, I work for LF1. Uh, we do uh, embedded development for anybody who'll pay. Uh, and we try and base it on Debian when they're letters. Uh, I've been interested in this for a while. I'm nominally project leader for the last three years or something, which means very little has happened in that time. Uh, but I'll tell you where we are and uh, where we're going. Uh, how many, before we start, how many of you already know all about embedded development? Well, you know, are interested, have done some, know what we're talking about. And how many of you, this is a kind of new area and you've got some widget, you just think it would be cool to put Linux on? Okay, a few of each. Um, so, to some extent, I've got you here under false pretenses today. The, uh, the talk was billed as, uh, it was suggested to me, in fact, by uh, Lars Visnius that uh, what we should do to encourage Debian to support embeddedness would be uh, demonstrate all the cool things you can do with embedded widgets and how easy it is and why we should all do it. Uh, so I thought that's a good idea. Uh, but I've just spent, uh, so the idea was I'd sit here and show you how to um, download the tools and install a tool chain and configure it for cross-building, build a kernel for your little widget download all the sources, uh, and then explain about how uh, cross-building works, uh, build a root fest, stick it on the machine, and it would sing songs or whatever. Um, and you'd all be suitably impressed and could go home and do it yourselves. Uh, so I spent the last week doing that. Uh, we got as far as installing a tool chain. That worked quite well. Uh, fixed a couple of things. Uh, configure for cross-building and try and build things, and no, nothing worked at all, really. It was all a disaster. So uh, the current state of the tools is that lots of things don't work. Um, if you want to do as I just described, uh, then go and use Scratchbox or Open Embedded because they actually do work. Um, uh, if you want to try and do it the pure Debian way, it makes life difficult. Uh, for some reasons, I'll go on to explain. So what I'm actually going to talk about today um, is so plan B, the, uh, <laughs> the reason why... Um, I haven't got all this working and marvellous and beautiful, uh, is that I spent most of the last month fighting software patterns and not preparing this talk or working on embedded Debian or anything else I was supposed to be doing. So uh, that's my excuse for uh, any disorganisation that may occur in the next hour or so. Uh, I, this worked quite well, though. So uh, we had a major success on that front. So the backup. This is uh, what you'll get. Uh, I'll just explain what Embedded Debian is for those of you who don't know and uh, tell you where we got to and explain some of the uh, pros and cons of this approach, uh, what we're trying to do, how it's supposed to work uh, and what we need to do next to actually make it work. And one of the things I want to, uh, we kind of got into it in the previous session, I don't know if there's anyone who's here who wasn't there about why uh, Debian supporting embedded stuff more than it does now is probably a good thing for everybody. So embedded Debian is uh, an official sub-project. It's all very uh, exciting. S the idea is that lots of people who are already familiar with developing the Debian way they use it um, would like to just be able to produce a mini version for a specific purpose. There's an awful lot of companies like mine that um, you know, people who don't know about embedded systems but have realized that they probably want to use Linux on their hardware um, need easy ways to build a system with this stuff on. Or alternatively, we build them a base system that they can put their special thing on. As someone mentioned this morning, you know, people often have a great deal of expertise in their particular application area, but they really don't know about building basic Linux systems. Um, in principle, Debian ought to be a good base for this kind of thing. Partly because of the um, multi-architecture support and all the tools we've got. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that it all has to be proper free tools. None of this uh, MonteVista and their secret configuration system, which is proprietary. Um, started uh, 
in the year 2000 by a guy called Frank Smith from Amerix, uh, who thought basically what I think, that this would be a good idea. Uh, and they produced uh, a tool chain that worked uh, for ARM and PowerPC, I think. Uh, and also a handy tool called, um, I'm sure it should be MDebsys, um, which is quite primitive, but it's also quite neat. Basically, you use the kernel configuration language and extend it into user space, so you can configure which tools you want, whether you want ping or um, mount or whatever, uh, and then it just goes and fishes the relevant binaries out of the Debian archive uh, and puts together a, a root FS. And the problem with that was uh, keeping it in sync with uh, the changing packages was a real pain. So uh, inevitably, it got left behind uh, by both the kernel and Debian. Uh, also, it was written in CML2, which um, never made it into kernel favor, which put it at something of a disadvantage. It did get updated to the new kernel config language. And people have used it for real commercial projects. You know, it works. Um, and, and it, it's arguably one of the best ways of producing a really small system is, is positively fishing out the binaries you want as opposed to building packages and throwing away the bits you don't want because it guarantees you don't end up with anything you didn't really, really need. Um, since then, we uh, basically started again uh, with uh, a new scheme with, uh, using dpackage cross and a thing called the STAG framework, which is basically the work of Philippe de Swert, who Unfortunately, isn't here today, um, and we've been fiddling with that for um, I don't know a year and a half now. Um, there's also been new tools, which is mostly the work of uh, Nikita Yushchenko. Um, so, people used to use um, well, well, all sorts of cross compilers from all over the place, uh, but it would make a lot more sense if you used the standard Debian source. Uh, so somebody did a thing called uh, toolchain source, which was a package which was basically just the toolchain source from which you could build a cross-compiler, which is all right, but it tends to get out of sync with the compilers people were using in the rest of Debian. Um, and obviously, it was much smarter to actually build the cross-compilers from the same source package that we build the normal compilers, um, which, after all, is something that the upstream source can do, so our packaging ought to be able to do it too. So Nikita fixed all that, so now we can build um, cross compilers for all Debian architectures from the same source. Um, they may even work. They're all available on uh, uh, mdebian.org. And obviously, increasingly, for a long time, basically, you wanted an x86 compiler to whatever target you want to use. Um, but these days, there's uh, more than one fast development machine you might conceivably be using. So um, hopefully, this week, we'll get the uh, PowerPC and AMD64 uh, development host versions working. So you'll have from all those three fast architectures to all the weedy small ones. Um, now, we don't want to put all of those tools in Debian because there's an awful lot of combinations. Um, you can work it out, um, 11 factorial or something, um, which hardly anybody needs, especially all the ones like, you know, you really don't need a, a cross compile that runs on ARM and produces x86 binaries. That will be dumb. Uh, so um, trying to put all of them in the Debian bucket is just a waste of space, really. So we, we'll just host them on um, mdebian.org or somewhere useful. So um, reasons why Debian isn't really where you want to start. Um, it's all built natively. There's good reasons for that. It's because it works. Uh, it's simple. That's the way everything was designed to be done. Um, but uh, embedded developers really don't like natively building. I mean, you can do, uh, and indeed, it can be quite practical if you have a fast enough um, target machine. So if, if you've got a fast ARM box, you can build your ARM binaries on that, uh, and it does save a lot of aggravation. And that's how quite a few people I work with actually operate. Um, you can buy a 600 megahertz uh, ARM desktop box, which will compile everything you know, pretty slowly by modern standards, but still fast enough. Um, but in practice, most embedded developers need to be able to cross-build things. Um, normally, Debian doesn't care at all about the size of binaries. Oh, we care a little bit, but basically people go, you can't buy hard disks more than 40 gig. You know, um, why are you complaining about a couple of hundred K here and there? Uh, and the answer is, of course, because 
uh, that thing's got 64 meg of flash in it. So your entire file system has to fit in 64 meg. In fact, it's got to fit in 60 meg because you quite like some data of your own. Um, so there is a dramatic difference. Um, I mean, embedded used to mean 32K. You know, these days it means like less than 32 meg. Uh, so it's got a lot bigger, uh, which is why Linux has become practical in embedded systems. Uh, In your average standard Debian package, there's a whole load of stuff that you don't need on your average uh, embedded system. All the documentation, most of it, uh, example files, vim coloring schemes, uh, 27 languages that you aren't going to use, all that sort of thing. Uh, so you want to be able to get rid of that. And by default, we tend to enable everything. So if, a, if it's possible to use something with X, then um, it will be compiled to do so. Um, or with some fancy font mangling system or whatever, all of that stuff. Um, and again, people want more control than that and often might not, on a lot of systems, there is no display. You don't want any of the X versions, but you still want the underlying functionality. Um, reasons why Debian's good. Um, the code base is nice. Everything's consistent. Files are where they're supposed to be. I mean, that's why a lot of us started using Debian in the first place. I know I used to hate Red Hat. Um, it was a great revelation to find that config files were always actually in slash etc where they were supposed to be and not somewhere bizarre. Uh, all that stuff, I mean, to some extent, I think that has gone upstream and, and the world's uh, a tidier place than it used to be in 1997. But uh, even so, um, it is nice. And you know it, it builds on all the architectures without aggravation because we checked. Uh, the multiple architecture support's good. Um, a lot of the targets people are actually using embedded systems supported in Debian, not all of them. People do use weird stuff like SH4. Actually, have we got an SH4 build? People had one for a while, but I'm not sure it's defunct. Uh, there, you know, there are. Uh, but in practice, most people are using ARM or PowerPC or uh, 68K or x86, of course. Um, and our management tools are, are quite nifty. If you start to look at how it all works, we can, in fact, do most of what's needed in terms of cross-building and installing, to, uh, installing packages not to the default file system, but to um, a target file system, uh, all of your own, you know, a, a cheroot or whatever. Um, it's all there, and it's a matter of bringing together these tools so that it works in a coordinated way. Uh, as we were discussing earlier, uh, we quite like having derived distributions. It provides um, useful ideas uh, and feedback and gets things fixed that wouldn't otherwise be fixed. Uh, and the familiarity of developers is one of the reasons why they quite like to be able to use something like Debian on their small devices. You know, not exactly the same, but having a lot of the um, things they're used to. So people who don't come from that background are quite happy to use any strange embedded system you give them, whereas people who are just used to Linux looking like Debian kind of like their other boxes to behave in a similar way. Uh, so that's the main target, I think, is people who uh, are already Debian users um, but do embedded things and want easy ways to prototype systems. Embedded Debian probably isn't the best way of producing f general production embedded systems. Um, there's uh, something like um, Open Embedded, I think will always have much finer grain control over what you can do, because uh, absolutely everything is possible within that framework. Um, but it is horribly complicated, even by our standards. Uh, and uh, it would be nice if we could produce something that let people prototype stuff um, quicker and easier than that. So to make this work, uh, we need uh, a scheme to cross-compile things. It doesn't break horribly. Uh, dealing with optimizations, generally things are optimized for speed, uh, whereas for embedded system you probably want to optimize for space. Uh, and in fact, it might end go faster anyway. <laughs> um, there's arranging things so that uh, you can manage the packages on the target device, which of course aren't going to be the same set of packages as on your host device, a build device. There'll be um, a small subset of them. And uh, as we'll talk about later, actually a slightly different arrangement, potentially. 
So you need some mechanism to say which, which bits you want. Uh, splitting packages up into smaller pieces helps a lot. So you have all the languages split out into a separate little language package, um, and the docs split off, and the X version split off, and so on. The, the, the finer grain your package management is, the more easier it is to get the bits you actually wanted rather than a whole load of stuff you didn't. One of the things um, that we kind of think about regularly at these events but haven't reached final conclusions on, I don't think, is uh, the packaging namespace. So if you take Debian Installer as an example, that is basically an embedded system based on Debian. Um, but it's designed to live in the same namespace. Uh, you know, all the Debian installer packages exist in parallel with the normal packages um, because of what it's designed to do. Uh, but in a lot of cases, you probably don't need to do that. And you, what you actually want to do is build a whole separate namespace a set of packages for your particular target, which don't have to work with Debian ones. Uh, on the other hand, there's a set of people who want to be able to prototype something quickly using a kind of standard base system, uh, a standard small base system, uh, and then stick in random Debian packages for obscure or complicated stuff because uh, it's not in our little mini build. And if you want to do that, you've got to have a compatible system. So you've got to be using the same libc. You can't be using uc libc and then stick in random Debian packages and expect it to work. I mean, you can do that to some extent, but that's making it all that difficult. So there's various, there's various ways you might want to do this. Um, and um, you probably can't support all of them at once. It would be nice if we could, um, but we certainly to start with, we've got to pick something and do that and prove it works before trying to satisfy um, all conceivable schemes at once, which just makes your life so difficult that you never get anywhere. Um, one thing people do want is a uh, customization mechanism for their particular device. Uh, you know, for the reasons of all the derived distributions we're talking about, there's always some stuff you want to change. It might just be the kernel. Um, it might be um, some kind of unified graphical goodness um, for the front end on your little widget. Uh, so a kind of organized way of applying your set of patches so that you can keep porting that forward as things move on easily uh, will be a very nice feature. Uh, that's something Open Embedded does really well. Um, it's something that's relatively difficult to stick into the um, depackage cross kind of Debian way of cross compiling things um, because we have one dirty great big patch instead of piles of little ones, which is what you really want. Staying in sync with Debian is the other thing. It, there's a very small number of people actually working on this at the moment. That's what, one of the reasons it's progressing fairly slowly. Um, and Debian keeps moving on, and our tools get left behind. And once we have a whole load of changed packages, um, if those things, if those changes aren't kept basically in Debian itself, then in practice it'll just get left behind immediately and become useless. Um, embedded Debian will only work unless, if, if either, several hundred people start working on it, <laughs> or um, we have a mechanism for keeping the changes from standard Debian um, within Debian, within normal packages. Um, and, and maintainers actually looking after those, those changes. So and for that to work, we have to get a fair amount of buy-in from Debian that this is something worth doing. So there's two major issues um, which are largely independent. There's cross-compiling things. Um, now, that's useful for embedded people, but it's useful for other reasons too. Um, as I mentioned, um, if your build deeds are sufficiently slow, you might actually want to cross-build that architecture just because you can do it in a um, hundredth of the time. Um, I think it would also be, um, it would gives the same benefits to Debian that building for a lot of architectures has given us in the past. You know, nobody else used to do that. Um, and it meant that Debian was the only thing where you could guarantee everything worked on um, big endian and little endian and different sizes of, of pointers and all the things that vary across architectures, the fundamental stuff. Um, an awful lot of those bugs were pushed upstream over the years as we've discovered that things were broken because people only write for the architecture they know. And, you, know you can't necessarily be expected to know that 
ARM has really strange float format, <laughs> um, which we're finally getting rid of. <laughs> so all those things that got fixed over the last decade, we can now not care about anymore. Um, so I think if we decided that Debian should be cross-buildable and fix things accordingly, because the mechanisms all exist. They've been there for a long time. There's an awful lot of crap in or cruft in autoconf and package config and all that stuff, which in theory means cross-building should work the way it's intended. But it doesn't um, for a lot of detailed reasons, like people never try it, <laughs> and uh, nobody understands autoconf, uh, and just copy the script from somewhere else, uh, and you, you know, the same badness that everybody else had. Um, an awful lot of the fixes are, in fact, already in Open Embedded because they've been going through this process for um, a year and a half. There is a great load of goodness in there which tells you what needs changing to make things build properly. Um, and to some extent, they're pushing that upstream as well. Sorry? What about the stuff that is intrinsically XL, right? So, uh, yeah. Um, do you want to save this for the end, okay. if you can remember? Um, because, yeah, I think we'll, there'll be quite a lot to talk about like this. Um, you're right, there is a whole lot of stuff which has to be run at build time. There's lots of things, build stuff and then run it for tests. Um, and there's a limit to how much of that you can do without creating a whole target environment that looks like the target environment and running things in it, which is what Scratchbox does. Um, and I think we want to use a lot of the good things that Scratchbox has done. Um, but to a large extent, well, I'll talk about that more on a, on a later slide, actually. And the other part of this is package modifications, um, which is um, throwing away the docs at the most primitive level. Um, so you can have a lot of basic heuristic rules which say, throw away all the examples, no, throw everything in user share. We don't care about that, except for about six files that are actually important, um, which will you know, do the right thing for a lot of packages. But for, in a lot of cases, you'll need specific rules for a particular package that say the way, we wanna, the way it should be done for a small build is like this. Um, and, in fact, we want three different versions of it for different purposes. Um, but these two things, the cross-compiling part and the uh, building shrunk packages part, are mostly independent. Uh, so what we're trying to do is, is reuse the existing package management system, dpackage and apt, uh, and add cross-compilation support uh, which in fact already exists uh, in the form of dpackage cross, um, which is you know, a tool designed to just um, build with dpackage build package. You just add a couple of options and say build it for ARM. Uh, uh, remove the stuff we didn't want and uh, have a scheme for installing the packages uh, either onto the development host for testing um, or on the target itself. So you, so you, can, either, you can either build your root file system uh, on your development box. You know, so you, you make all your packages, and then you install them to the sort of virtual target, uh, and then you copy the results across onto your actual target. Uh, or you can make packages which the target can install itself. So there's two different models. It depends whether you want to just make a widget and give people a system image, um, or whether it's kind of like a PDA and they actually want to be able to have a set of packages which you can choose things from uh, and chop and change. Um, so the things we fiddled with, oh, right, these slides are now going to get in slightly randomized order. So I do apologize if it becomes a bit disjoint. Uh, that's um, the fault of software patterns. Uh, <laughs> Dpackage cross is um, this thing that has existed in Debian for a while. I, I think it was originally produced for uh, people who just needed to build like an ARM version of a particular package in order to do a porter's binary upload. Um, but nevertheless, it, it's basically a wrapper for dpackage build package, which um, sets a whole load of stuff and can fill in config variables and generally do arbitrarily complicated things uh, in order to uh, set all the things that should be set such that if your package build system is properly constructed, it will just spit out the right thing at the end. Um, as uh, Scratchbox buyers can tell you, life is nothing like that simple in practice. Um, but the principle seems reasonably sound. Uh, it, it, may, it automatically means that the, uh, the build system is, t is told to use the right compiler 
uh, and the right bin utils and the right strip and all that sort of thing. Uh, so um, the way we've implemented this is basically just wrappers uh, for dpackage and apt, which uh, give you the right options. So this is what your uh, the standard setup on your normal Debian box. You have your repository um, with binary and source packages in it. Uh, you can get a list of those packages, um, which apt puts in a local database, so you know what's available. Uh, and then you get those into your local cache. Uh, you can you can build them, uh, or you can just install them. And there's a database of what's installed. You, know, you all more or less know how that works. Uh, so to do that for the embedded setup, we have basically the same thing, but slightly more complicated. So now there's a second repository list for the target architecture and a second locally available database for the target architecture and a second local database of installed packages for the target architecture. So, you know, it's not difficult. Um, and that way you can manage the set of packages on your device separately from the set of packages on your machine. Uh, now, apt and dpackage already provide all the technology we need to do this. We don't have to write any new software. It's great. Um, now, why wasn't that the next slide? Um, because I'm rubbish. Oh, and how do I go backwards? Right. Um, I'll show you that in a minute. <laughs> so, the way you do this, you download your sources and build everything on your development machine. The parameters which control the cross compiling uh, live in. ETC dpackage cross compile, which tells it which architecture it should be, uh, assuming you have a default one, uh, and where the tool chain lives, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, and it, in fact, also provides a mechanism for uh, special versions of things, which I'll come to in a minute. That's quite a new feature. Um, you build things with dpackage build package the way you did before, and uh, then there's a wrapper around dpackage for actually installing the um, the packages you've built into your uh, local target system. Uh, on the actual device, when you get later, so you haven't used your device at all up till now, but when you finally dig it out and make it work, um, you can use ipackage to install those packages rather than dpackage if you want to save the um, phenomenal amount of space you'll save by doing that, because dpackage's databases are very large, especially when you've got a lot of packages. Uh, ipackage is a lot more efficient in that regard, but it's basically compatible, so you can choose which one you want to use um, on the end device. You can't use ipackage for all this build stuff because it's not smart enough. So this is the, the neat new feature that's been added to dpackage cross recently, which is basically you can have a set of modes Basically, you can have arbitrarily complicated flags for all sorts of purposes. It's very generic, but there's a special MDebian flag, which basically says um, all the tools that you normally use for building. So this affects Deb Helper. Um, if we got round to it, it would affect CDBS and uh, any other obscure build schemes which we don't know about. Can be told things like um, by default throw away the docs. Um, uh, you know, by default um, remember to link with the um, target architecture libraries and not the host ones uh, when doing dpackage lib depths um, and generating all the runes. So by because a lot of the packages are built with the same tools, by changing those tool scripts a little bit to just make them cross-compile aware, uh, you get quite a lot of this almost for free by basically setting this flag. Um, so that bit works. So at least it was working in February, um, but since then uh, something's changed and it's now broken again as I discovered this week which is why I'm not going to demonstrate it by actually typing it, because all you get is obscure runes about not being able to set cross-prefix to cross-prefix. Um, but you can also specify in the scope here uh, all the extra flags. So if you want to build everything with um, dash M CPU um, strong arm, or, uh, or you want to add soft float or um, you know, other compiler flags, basically you stick them in here, and they get given to every single package that gets built. 
you can specify a different C library and, and so on. So um, that's the kind of fundamental control level mechanism. So this is how the, the wrapper stuff to make apt do um, all that stuff about retaining a separate set of lists for the architecture. Um, you know, it's, it's not very complicated. You tell it what the apt architecture is and um, that it should be using a different sources.list because you probably want to get your file from somewhere else. 15 minutes, Jesus, right, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and that the, uh, the cache is somewhere else and so on. Uh, and the, that anything that gets installed gets installed to a different place from the default root file system. Basically the same with dpackage stag. Sorry, a D package. There's a wrapper for it, which just gives it the right runes every time. Um, so that does quite a lot of what you want uh, at the basic level. So um, there's a fundamental problem of how do you control the the bits that are different for uh, embedded builds. Um, now we kind of hummed and hard about this. Uh, we're now on the second generation of the scheme, which um, I still view very much as an experimental implementation. So at the moment, you have your Debian directory, which contains the control files and um, stuff, everything you need to build, Debian rules. Um, so now we have an mDebian directory as well. So if an mDebian directory is present, then the tools, these new tools, will use that preferentially. Um, so that's how you get to have uh, different packages, different dependencies, um, and different build options. The problem with that is because it's a separate directory, it's not at all obvious to your maintainer that there's all this, you know, basically we've got two copies of a lot of information. We could copy the standard rules and then change them a bit. And those will go out of sync horribly over time. Um, if anyone can think of a much better scheme. The, the main advantage of this was that we could, we could tack it on to existing packages without getting in anybody's way. So we could experiment with this system, prove it was actually uh, valid, uh, and then worry about uh, trying to and yeah, you know, we could we could get that into people's packages without it, it changing anything at all, one jot of their work, which was would be relatively painless. We we're hoping, so that's the advantage of this scheme. Uh, it's entirely non-intrusive, um, but it may not be the best way to keep maintenance in the long term. So package doesn't change much. We add this in Debian subdirectory with um, new build info, which is usually very similar but just slightly different. Um, Blah, 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 told all that. Splitting the docs out is a good thing because, uh, as uh, Timo will tell you later in the week, um, the docs produce an awful lot of circular dependencies in Debian, which makes it incredibly hard to build the whole thing from scratch. You have to have Debian already in order to build Debian. It's a bit of a pain for embedded systems where you really would like to be able to build the whole thing from, from a tool chain up, from glibc upwards, because um, that way it definitely comes out right. Um, so the way you actually use this, you install um, your modified tools, modified deb helper and dpackage and dpackage cross, um, set that mdebian flag, uh, and then just build things with a dash a arm uh, instead of what you normally did. And in principle, uh, it spits out all your Debian packages for another architecture. Uh, uh, as I observed earlier, that generally doesn't work except for extremely simple packages. Uh, <laughs> Um, and that's where um, we're going to have a session afterwards and sit around and, and hack some things and discuss about uh, stealing a number of the good bits out of uh, Scratchbox, especially the ability to run uh, non-native binaries uh, in order to do compile time tests. Uh, the the multi-arch stuff I think is also very interesting in this regard. You know, it's primarily aimed at x86 and AMD64, but in fact uh, you can also get it to uh, run ARM test binaries uh, during the build, um, um, which you know could be useful. Uh, so yeah, so as I said, the tools will fix, will improve packages from our point of view without you making any changes to them at all. Um, and then there's a more specific set of changes you can make uh, if necessary. So these are the scripts that need modifying uh, in dpackage dev because all of them need to know about the, M basically just knowing about the mDebian directory as well as the Debian directory and using it preferentially if it exists. It's not rocket science actually. If you look, you'll find there's lots of trivial little modifications to all the scripts. 
Uh, so things that don't work so well. Depackaged cross, as I say, was really designed. So it, it's a handy tool. If you need to build something uh, for ARM, uh, you need to have all the libraries it needs, at the very least. To, um, and Depackage Cross basically lets you get those libraries from the existing uh, architecture pile. So you already ha well, Debian already has all the ARM libraries pre-built. Um, and it's just, you can basically do Depackage Cross package name. It'll fish out the library files and the, sorry, package name and architecture. It'll fish out the library files and the header files uh, for, and package config files for um, all the libraries you need, stick them in the right place so that the cross-build system will just find and use them. Uh, what it doesn't have is uh, a neat way of actually sucking the f binaries in the first place. As far as I can tell, you have to go to packages.debian.org and download them with wget uh, each time, which is incredibly rubbish because <laughs> um, we have lots of other tools that sort of do that, um, like apt-build, um, but I couldn't get it so that it would just get the few packages you need for this particular build dependency. Um, apt would get carried away and go, no, but if I need those, I need all these, and I need all these, and, I do. and then you know, it says, right, we'll download 336 megabytes of packages, basically an entire system. And you go, no, I don't need an entire system, I just need the stuff for this package. Uh, now, that could just be because I'm very stupid, and someone will explain to me uh, later what the right rune for that is, uh, but it was annoying me this week. You do need to be root for a lot of this stuff to work, but then um, that's kind of true for package building anyway with the fake root stuff. Um, I can see that it could be a problem in some environments. It kind of depends whether there's lots of developers um, trying to use a system or if it's just you and your box, in which case it probably doesn't matter. Um, if we put in runes for an awful lot of packages, um, the single, the fact that all the bodges for cross-building something properly go in etc, so it should be dpackage cross-compile, uh, it's going to get to be a very big file after a while if we've got little secret runes for, for a thousand packages in there. Uh, so it probably needs splitting up, but um, the, that, can be, that can come later. Uh, the other thing I think that needs a bit of thought is on embedded systems, almost invariably, you don't use a whole load of the base file stuff, you use BusyBox instead. Uh, and you don't tend to use standard xlibs and x and all the associated cruft, you use tinyx instead. Um, so there's a kind of base system which you will usually want to use, which has a fundamentally different set of dependencies. Uh, and I haven't quite got my head around exactly how we're going to do that. Um, I'm sure we can, um, but it needs somebody smarter than me to explain to me what the correct runes are. Um, so once you've generated a whole load of these packages, uh, then you use stag get, as I mentioned earlier, which will just, so you just do stag get arm update, stag get arm install package, and it'll just take your packages from the pile. So, so once we have produced um, a, an example embedded Debian, you know, we can do a standard one, which will probably satisfy a lot of people, which is basically Debian, you know, probably 500 packages from Debian that people actually use, uh, and a much smaller base system with BusyBox and TinyX, then uh, most people can just point their point stag get at that uh, and use it. And they, that way they can produce embedded systems in about a quarter of an hour. Uh, and then they put their one application on top that they actually want to use that's new or different. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, where are we? Um, so we have the tools to do this. Um, but they don't work very well, uh, which is why um, uh, I want smart people in this room to come and uh, have a good hack later so we can at least get things up to date uh, and see how much of a system we can build that works. Uh, we have a build machine, um, which is five minutes, right? Okay. Does that include questions as well? Uh, yes. Right, okay. I better shut then, haven't I? Um, I'm nearly at the end, which is good. Uh, and we need to build, actually build, an example distro that people can try out. Uh, that means making a list of the things, packages that people actually need. I'm not sure what the minimal set of packages is, um, but uh, making a list, say, these are the first 200 that we ought to compile, and then um, 
that will satisfy a lot of people, or 500 or however many it is. Um, adding QEMU, which I've mentioned earlier. Diddly do. Um, yeah, we covered that pretty much. Somebody from Debian Installer ought to come and help because I haven't taken enough notice of exactly how they've done what they've done, uh, and I'm sure that we ought to make sure that we're not inventing things which they've already worked around. Uh, now the other thing is that ultimately, um, the Scratchbox guys are well ahead of me on this. They've been playing this game for a couple of years already, uh, and have discovered that it's hard work, and um, doing things this way is difficult. Uh, so basically, Scratchbox works around a lot of these problems by um, not fixing all the broken build systems uh, and just providing a big sandbox so that the broken build systems still do the right thing, which is very cool. Um, but what I'm kind of interested in is whether it's possible to actually fix all the build systems and do it kind of cleanly and properly um, with rather less stuff needed uh, to make it work. Um, I don't know. Maybe it isn't, in which case you know, those solutions are, in fact, already the best way of doing it, and I should just give up with this. <laughs> um, the other thing is, can we persuade everyone in Debian that cross-compilability is a good thing? Because if we can't do that, this probably isn't going to get very far. Uh, and can the changes we make to Debian be kept in step with Debian as it rushes along in its headlong epicness? Uh, again, if not, we have a problem. We'll just keep getting left behind, and we'll never get anywhere. Um, there are, pro there are all sorts of odd build systems out there. Now, most of this stuff should work for autoconf uh, and for deb helper. But when people do exotic, kind of build it and then build it again from the results of the amazing make file, which built all your Debian make files and stuff, um, life will get difficult. Um, these people have all helped out. Ons has provided the build box we've got somewhere in the States or New Zealand or somewhere. I don't know where it is. But uh, basically, we've got a box we can play with. Um, that's that. Right. Jolly good. Questions? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> As we went to all the trouble to make it appear on the camera. So this is just uh, an example system, uh, which we didn't build with Embedded Debian, of course, because it's rubbish and doesn't work. Um, this was built with Open Embedded. But this is the kind of cool stuff you can do. This is 64 mega flash, um, packed with um, Firefox and um, a proper email client, which is... Oh, you're supposed to be able to see it up there. Yeah, sorry. Um, magic technical people, <laughs> make my thing appear. We also had a question. Yes. Okay, so, um, Someone ask a question. Yeah, okay, so what, where do you think you're putting all the uh, configurations where it makes sense? Um, there's, there's a whole, in, in the in ETCD package cross compile, you have all the configure variables for a particular architecture and for Linux. Oh, sorry, yes, repeat the question. Where are we going to put all the configure variables? Uh, Dpackage cross basically takes care of that. There's a set of files. So you, there's one for, if you're using Linux, configure variables look like this. If you're using ARM, configure variables look like this. Um, so we can add an arbitrary set of those files. Um, if you're using embedded Debian, some configuration variables look like this. So that's going to be the page cross That's right. So that's a feature of Dpackage cross. Um, all right, so we've got our netbook. So this is a quick 30-second demo just to show that you can do quite neat things. Um, um, we should have the Nokia people here because um, this is even cooler, I'm sure, because it's newer. Um, so this is a whole load of apps. This is the GNU Palm Top environment plus um, Mozilla, Abbey Word, GNUmeric, um, uh, GPDF, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and this little thing in the corner, Therian Editor, is, is a scheme which basically means you can stick in. So that's what fits in 64 mega flash. But if you've got things that don't fit, so Therian is a, an extremely obscure one of my packages in Debian um, for uh, drawing cave surveys, uh, which requires TCLTK and all of Tetec and a whole load of garbage. Um, and basically, you can just fish all of that stuff out of Debian, standard Debian packages, stick them on a compact flash, and put them in uh, and add a little app icon, and that appears. And and runs. So you can add a random vertical app to the basic system um, slowly. So this is a strong arm 400 megahertz PXA thing. Um, as you can see, GPDF runs really, really quickly. But it does work. Uh, <laughs> and, and what this gives you. Well, that's the video package. It, it is, yes. Yeah. So that's that Therian TCL thing finally started up. Mozilla goes fast enough to be you know, quite usable. 
It's a little bit sluggish, but uh, it works. Uh, and what this, this lets you do is have all the stuff you need uh, on a basic system, so text editor, email, web browser, PDF reader, um, calendar app, blah, 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 um, you know, in 64 megs of stuff. And that was built with Open Embedded, uh, and it took, um, I don't know, about eight of us, uh, eight months or something. Yeah, that was a big job. Um, we spent a lot of science money on that. It uh, has a tear on it as well. It, it, does it? Oh, yeah, so it does. Yes, indeed. And to be fair, this inv included a lot of work. Uh, if you look at the standard version of Balsa, it's got a lot more uh, menus and options and things. It's been, this has had a human interface man go over it and basically throw away most of it, saying, you don't need that, don't need that, don't need that. People don't know what any of these things are for. Get rid of them. Hide them in extra menus that say more at the bottom. Um, yeah, we are like that. You know, so all the extra cruft that used to live there is hidden from your normal user. Um, and quite a lot of the work went into that. And that's the sort of thing where open embedders is good because you know, there was some fairly heavy patches, um, but you know, it's got a mechanism for basically keeping your dirty great patch for your special version of the applications. Um, so anyway, yes, that's a cool toy. Um, it does, yes. yes. So OpenOffice goes in on the compact flash card. That's what the mechanism was devised for. And I haven't got that on this card, I'm afraid, because I was much more interested in cave surveying than OpenOffice. <laughs> it does run it very slowly. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we'll have to. Uh, we'll have to stop there. there. Okay. So uh, the thing I do need to say is um, there will be uh, a hack fest for the rest, well, Tuesday and Wednesday and the rest of today uh, on Embedded Debian. Uh, so anyone who's interested in uh, this sort of thing, um, please come to wherever the hacking is. Um, there's a room for it, I gather. Uh, Smoky, yes. Smoky or something. Uh, and uh, we will be there in the corner um, playing with this stuff. Uh, thank you.